Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 205. Science Faction Homo Heidelbergensis. Heidelbergensis. This, of all the homo species, this one sounds like a, they're hiding a Yiddish word for complaining or something. <laughs> Uh, indeed, this one lived about 800,000 to 200,000 years ago. It was first discovered in Heidelberg, Germany in 1908, where local paleontologists were looking for bones to do weird sex stuff with, undoubtedly. Uh, this is... <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a very specialized school of archaeology. <laughs> yeah. But this species also ranged through Africa, including South Africa. It was in Italy, France, and Spain. It is a descendant of Homo erectus, which we covered beforehand, and it's likely our direct ancestor. So, w Homo sapiens, we think at least, evolved directly from Homo heidelbergensis, as did the Denisovans, as did the Neanderthals. So we know that we have at least three species, all of our cousin species, that all seem to originate from this one grandfather species, Homo heidelbergensis. Heidelbergensis was a lot like erectus, had a very similar body type, but had a much bigger brain. We see a huge brain increase when we get to Heidelbergensis, where they're basically just below modern sapien, if not at modern sapien, but they have more primitive features. They're lacking a chin. They have the, the sloped back head with less of the flattened face. But how are their abs? Like, I mean, like, like we've established a long line of hominids that can look good from the neck down. Is this one of those hominids? Killer six packs on these guys. Uh, they also are accredited with the oldest known wood spears that date back to around 300,000 years old, which we think were thrown. They're throwing spears. So these are creatures that are doing some complex things. They are making stone tips on some of their spears that date back to 500,000 years old. They're a really interesting species because they spread out through all of Africa, all of Asia, and you'll sometimes call, hear them called Homo rhodesiensis when they're in Africa. But much like Erectus and Ergaster, even though there's some dispute in the community, we think that's likely the same species. And again, this is our parent species. This is the one that gave birth, we think, to Homo sapiens, ranged a huge way throughout the old world, throughout Africa, Europe, and uh, Asia, and was able to do all these complex stuff, fire making, tool making, and stuff. Some interesting stuff. One of these skulls from South Africa, Africa of this species actually happens to be the first case in the hominid lineage of cavities in their teeth. Did they not brush regularly? Did not brush regularly. Did they lie about flossing a lot? <laughs> Every time they were in the dentist chair. The issue is probably that they are starting to diversify and eat more fruit species, uh, eat other types of high sugar content foods. So if I just ate meats, meats alone, red meats, mm -hmm. I would have low low incidence of cavities. You would have lower than, yeah, than just gobbling down Captain Crunch all the day. But this begins a very sad trend in human history where from this point on, there's a significant portion of the human population that will suffer greatly from tooth infections throughout their life and oftentimes die from them. So there's a great Dawkins quote about eons and eons of mankind suffering excruciating pain and eventually dying because of their teeth. And we have, you know, in the last 300 years kind of shucked that off and that is no longer the case. But it's, it's funny to think that for the vast majority of all of human history, when you died, it was either because you got malaria, you had a horrible, painful tooth infection, or you died a violent death in some kind of altercation. Were we not able to lick death from tooth infection? Until we invented the door and the string technology. Yeah, you couldn't pull out the tooth then. There is actually some interesting stuff that we'll get into later as we get into later hominid species where they are performing some kind of dental surgeries using stone and bone tools, which, I mean, honestly, it's 2017 and I still am not super comfortable going to get a cavity filled with the Novocaine and the whole nine yards. Could you imagine just some crazed Neanderthal coming at you with an antler and a piece of an obsidian? Maybe it wasn't really meant to be helpful. Maybe maybe that was your punishment in the village. Like, hey, we're going to take out that tooth <laughs> if you fuck up. It's worth noting that there aren't really clear lines delineating it from Erectus or later on from Neanderthals. In fact, a lot of people will dispute whether or not a specific fossil lies in a specific species. And that's just something we got to remember, especially with these extinct species. It's a long period of time. There's a lot of transition time between there. And we have to just kind of make arbitrary lines and say it's this brain size or the presence of this particular bone formation or this or this. But in reality, we're seeing a living population that changes over time from one thing to another. That's how evolution works. It's not like all of a sudden one species gives birth to another. Every species basically looks like its parents and its children look like them. And slowly over time, small changes build up to be bigger ones. 
There's actually evidence of cannibalism or at least ritual defleshing on some Homo heidelbergensis bones. We see some cut marks. Like uh, like uh, House Bolton, the flayers. Yeah, they, uh... they could have been. I actually think there was some ritual castration going on. So yes, it might have been like the Boltons. So a lot of Lord Barrises. Yeah. <laughs> or Theon Greyjoy's. Yeah. We don't know if that was necessarily they were eating them, though maybe. And quite frankly, whenever people look down on cannibalism in Paleolithic times, I always kind of remind them, like, if it's between eating a dead person and dying, you're kind of dumb if you don't eat the dead person. But they could also just be, and we know this is true of some human communities, taking the flesh off the bones, cutting the flesh off the bones for some kind of ritual purposes. That's that's true as well. How does human meat taste? Or a Homo heidelbergensis, if you know that. Yeah, uh, I do. Actually, I've been eating a lot of Heidelberg recently. <laughs> I'm on the paleo diet where you only eat <laughs> paleolithic hominids. Uh, a lot of heidelbergensis. Uh, it's good. Everybody says uh, it tastes like chicken. Not true. In fact, it tastes like Homo floresiensis. So it tastes like a Latin lover. Gotcha. <laughs> There are some rumors, some very interesting ones from, by the way, some legitimate paleontologist, uh, Lee Berger down in South Africa, who believes he has skeletons indicative of giant Homo heidelbergensis that are essentially like seven feet tall, which would be interesting if you ran into a giant hominid like Homo heidelbergensis, because that would be terrifying. We talked before about Homo erectus being, you know, the the velociraptors of that time and and being a, a scary group to encounter. A seven-foot-tall Heidelbergensis. While I don't think that's true, by the way, there's a lot of skepticism towards that, and I, I think it's kind of an outlandish claim, it would be terrifying. Could that just be the Heidelbergensis basketball team? They play other <laughs> hominids? Yeah. Well, it was. Actually, yeah, he, he, he got kicked out of the NBA, and he had to go overseas to play. That's why they found him <laughs> in South Africa. By the way, congratulations for not naming Tim White again. Yes, just Lee Berg. Well, Tim White wouldn't have come up with the giant theory. He's a very careful scientist. He wouldn't have been so, so, so hazard about it. So you brought up Lee Berger just to insult Lee Berger and question <laughs> his scientific credentials. I was going to let it slide. You're the one on the burger camp. I don't know what's up. <laughs> Why are you trying to jerk off burger? All right, speaking of jerking off burgers, my, I am your host, <laughs> comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? Doing great. I think a hot dog lends itself to jerking off way better than mm-hmm. the burger. Yeah, that is, I mean, that's a valid point. <laughs> yeah. One can't argue with science. But you're more likely to American pie a burger than you are a hot dog. Very, very true. And we were supposed to uh, have a return of one of our famous scientists, Dr. Ava, today. Unfortunately, she's having some health issues and will not be able to attend. Otherwise, she would have undoubtedly protested to my sweet German insult earlier. Oh, I'm Dr. Ava. I've, I just made it in. Oh, yes, I was feeling ill, but I am feeling much better now, and I think I will be able to participate in the episode as if nothing has happened. It's like somebody has a recording of Dr. Ava, and they're just playing it into a microphone. Oh, glad to have you, Dr. Ava. Jump right on in whenever you feel good. <laughs> and, of course, go ahead and check out our website, www.thesciencefaction.com, for all the articles we cover here, as well as the ones we don't get to. And, by the way, as you might have heard, we are getting pretty close to Homo sapien in our hominid <laughs> intro bit. So we're going to need a new intro bit. We've gone through the periodic table of the elements. We've gone through the geological time periods. We've gone through the fundamental forces. And now we're almost done covering all of the hominids. So we want you to suggest to us what our next one should be. Just go ahead and tweet us at Faction Science. I consider myself the Bernie Sanders of this podcast. I am for the people. Okay. And I feel I would not be doing the people justice if I didn't let our newer fans know that the last time we opened up a vote Mm -hmm. for what the intro topic should be... Even though there was only one vote, and right. it wasn't even cast in the forum sure. that we requested, yeah, you listened to your wife, and yes. that was that. She you, had a good. She had a good suggestion. The you ignored democracy. Good. That's right. She had a good. I'm more of a strongman, podcast strongman. You, you are the FCC <laughs> taking away. There is no neutrality on this I show. I consider myself the science faction Putin. That's kind of what I'm going for. <laughs> and in true Putin fashion, I only have my job because Bobby has a P tape of me. <laughs> Which I've asked him to share with the public many times. I won't put it on the website, no matter how much you demand it. It's science in a sort. All right, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. Article number one. Move over, sociology. One-fifth of material chemistry papers may be total bullshit. This would never happen in a respectable field like linguistics. Our papers are much more thorough than other sciences. Well, here that's actually funny. This is one of the mistakes that got made that caused this, is a lot of times people think, okay, I understand what we call the replication crisis, which is something we had in psychology recently. We covered it in Science Faction. They went back to a lot of psycho- published psychology papers and found out that they could not replicate the data. A lot of them. And that was a huge issue, but they kind of wrote it off by saying, well, that's because it's psychology, it's, it's not real, science. yeah, there's so much wiggle room, which I get. 
But the idea was, well, we have these other things like physics, like chemistry, especially things like material chemistry, which is very, very, like, that it's is a very, hard. It's an erect science. It's, it's super hard. It is a rigid, throbbing science. <laughs> Flaccid psychology. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's nothing like that impotent psychology. And they were like, no, we have this super hard science. We know ours is correct. In fact, we don't even have to do a lot of repeat studies. And that was their downfall. So we had this replication crisis a while ago in psychology where we realized, man, a lot of these things just don't work out. They can't be replicated. Even age-old, really cornerstone-type experiments that were a big part of psychological theory and psychological knowledge, a lot of those can't be replicated. It turns out that we were having a similar problem in chemistry. I don't want to jump to conclusions here, but is it China again? It is not. It's not China. Though I will say this. We should, before we get going, we should make a distinction between, let's say, the uh, rigid, throbbing science we mentioned of uh, material chemistry, the uh, somewhat flaccid science of psychology, and I guess what would be the inverted penis of sociology. (laughs) Because... There is an issue with sociology that's even bigger, which is that major sociology journals, and we cover this as well, they will actually publish nonsense. They, uh, One researcher, just to see, had a computer-generated nonsense that just basically strung together a bunch of nonsense words, and then he submitted it to a very well-respected sociology journal. We're not talking about one of those pay-for-play, foreign, overseas, no one knows your, your thing. He submitted it to the like one of the major sociology journals, and they published it. So sociology has a whole different issue where they're not actually following scientific guidelines. I mean, you still referred, you said a respected sociology journal, right. but I mean, like, I, I think that after an incident like this, it, should its credit rating change? <laughs> Absolutely, it did. Yeah, it got downgraded to like a 420. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the entire field is a little different. They didn't have the same standards for publication. They didn't have the same standards for peer review. This is a different issue. And so let's get into what they actually found. The researchers looked at published reports in material chemistry, looking at MOFs, which are metal organic frameworks. And basically, these are compounds that we put together in order to try and do certain things. In this case, what they're looking at is the absorption of CO2. So obviously, we have a big problem with CO2 in a lot of different arenas. If you have something that can pull CO2 out of the air, or if you are outputting a bunch of exhaust and you want to pull the CO2 out of that exhaust to meet certain requirements, these are really important compounds. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of research going into this field. They basically wanted to look and see, are the reports of the effectiveness of certain MOS, metal organic frameworks, in removing CO2, are they accurate? Is this true? So they they found that 20% of results were outside the error bars, and not like close, like wrong, not even close, completely out of left field. Like if I'm, if I'm, if the error bars are a parking space, Mm -hmm. how outside of my parking space am I? Somewhere between a Filipino and Japanese parker. Holy shit. Yeah. This, this is interesting because like we talked about, this is an issue with psychology, huge issue with sociology, but it's something that hard sciences like chemistry thought they were beyond. Who's in charge of recreating these studies? Well, that's the thing. That's the way science works. We have to remember this. So when, when you hear this, a lot of times people say, see, science doesn't work or here's the flaw in science. No, 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 no. This is part of the process because people think, oh, you've published a peer-reviewed article. That means this is science. We're done with this. No, that's literally the entry point. What has to happen to kind of put this in more of a scientific canon is that other unrelated labs are in different places without the same connections and no financial incentive have to recreate your results. That's a huge part of science. Replicability is the part of science. So when you do a peer review published article, sometimes people, especially lay people, will see that and think, oh, there we go. That's what science, quote unquote, science says. Well, first of all, science is a process, not a overarching idea, but it's, it's not even into any kind of scientific canon or any kind of certainty until we start getting independent replicated results. In this case, when they went back to these one-off studies, studies and tried to replicate them, 20% were unable to be replicated. Does that invalidate a lot of the science that these, that... It just, it reinforces the idea that we can't think that a single peer review article really tells us anything more than here's an interesting thing we need to continue to research. Should we conclude that the people who who did the original study just lied their ass off? No. Or No, and that's a good question. So why did this happen? Well, the thing about these metal organic frameworks is if we're looking at can they absorb CO2, are they at this level? There's two things to keep in mind. One is when we do studies, we're looking at a P of 0.05, which is your certainty that the results are not due to chance. Because obviously... It, I'm very unsatisfied with P's smaller than <laughs> at 0.05. Or... I've heard that about you. Because <laughs> obviously there's always the chance that you have a one in a million shot and you get some weird results, right? So when you do your math, you do it to try and see that 
there's only a 5% or less chance, which is that PO5, that there is a 5% or less chance that the results are due to just chance, due to being on one tail of the bell curve, right? So you have to automatically say, okay, well, up to 5%, depending on the certainty levels of some of these experiments, we should expect to not be replicable. Secondly, go in and say, well, what is it about these metal organic frameworks that might make these specifically susceptible to that mistake? And there is a really easy answer, which is that these metal organic frameworks are very, very delicate. You have to produce them in a lab. There is a complex series of events to create these very complicated chemicals. You cannot components. swear in front of them. Not at all. They're like little kids or Mormons. You're not allowed to swear in front of them. They take a bunch of CO2. <laughs> And until their fontanelles close, you really can't roughhouse with no, them. No, no. So to produce these is a very complex process. And not only is the process complex, but what happens to these metal organic frameworks from the point at which they're produced to the point at which they're tested affects their ability to do their job. So you're going to get differing results, and you might not know that. You're working in a lab. You just get this metal organic framework, this, this sheet of metal or this piece of metal, and you are going to test its absorption rate of CO2. You don't understand that the barometric pressure, the humidity in the lab that you're in affects it. Whether or not it's exposed to sunlight can affect it. Its exposure to other chemicals can affect it. All of these can change the results of the experiment. So you go on with your one-off experiment and you get drastically different results than someone would do if they had much tighter controls on that material. So some of it is just you could call it sloppiness, but it's more so like they don't, a lot of times they didn't even know that doing different things to this material in between its production and its testing would give different results. And so while, yes, they are publishing results that are technically false, it's not necessarily due to malfeasance. It's just due to accidentally realizing, shit, we're not, be, we're not being careful enough with these testing. What if the scientist consciously forgot mm -hmm. to test it in the dark and, and, these right, other, right. and humidity? But they've thoroughly tested it, uh, this material, under conditions like being in the room while I'm cheating on my wife. I think, however, it's a really good lesson because we've had this lesson. The, the psychology replication crisis was huge news in science. It really made people rethink, are we doing this correctly? Are we really checking our numbers? Are we going back? Because some of these were really trademark experiments that were hallmarks of, of psychology. And that gave us a big kind of kick in the pants of, Oh man, we need to we need to really check on this stuff. We need to perform science correctly and and replicate experiments. Up until now, we kind of thought that was associated with those softer sciences. And now that we have something like material chemistry showing similar results, it shows us that man, even this is not immune. Things like physics and chemistry, part of the scientific process is replication, and we forget about it so much. But it's really the crucial part because until then, all you're doing is saying, "Hey, look, we have found this out. Not this seems to be true." Could you apply this same principle to scientific greats like Freud? I mean, what if we all... Yes, really actually, most, most of the stuff Freud said is we've now <laughs> said it's probably not true. It turns out everybody doesn't want to have sex with their mother. They want to have sex with their, like, third aunt. <laughs> I mean, I've seen some hot aunts, so maybe. Yeah. Usually she'd have kids. She didn't fall apart. It's... But it also means that we should use this as kind of... I think this is a great teaching tool to teach people about that particular part of science. Hey... What makes science special isn't that some really smart guy said something. It's not even that some really smart guy conducted an experiment and it turned out to give good results. What makes science special is that a bunch of really smart people did a bunch of experiments and they all agreed with each other. And that is how we get to truth. Because underlying this all is this idea of what is true and what is not. And that's what's underlying science as well. The way to get to truth isn't an argument from authority where we listen to somebody who's supposedly smart or supposedly knows what they're talking about or has even conducted an experiment. The way you get to the truth is through torture. That's right. That's right. It's all waterboarding. <laughs> That's how they figured out that these papers weren't working out. 20% 20, 20 of the scientists cracked. <laughs> but... The way to really get to truth is to continually have people check up on your results. And by the way, speaking of somebody, you know, who has published a few papers and who has done stuff like this, you don't cringe at the idea of somebody replicating your results. You might hope they get the same thing. You might feel a little nervous. Oh, I hope they get the same results. But you hope that they try to, because if you have published in good faith and you have done the work correctly, that other person should get the same results, and you should be happy to see that because that's a good replication. And anytime you hear somebody else is checking up on your work, while it's fair to be nervous and be like, ooh, I hope this works out, you should also welcome that moment because that is how we get closer and closer to what is true. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of papers don't get verified. Yes, that's what so, we're talking about. So, so, so if your paper gets verified, you you got asked to the dance. Yeah. Somebody thought your paper was interesting enough. Right. And even better, some people are like, yeah, but this guy really hates me. Sometimes that's better. You know, assuming that even if this guy doesn't like your research or doesn't agree with it or doesn't think it's in good faith, assuming that they're going to follow the process correctly, somebody who didn't believe what you published and then looks at the research, if your research is good should then change their mind. For instance, we talked about the whole Cerruti Mastodon site. I have actually made an appointment. I'm going to go check on those bones and those supposed stone tools myself to go see. And if I get convinced that those are actually the remains of some hominid left 130,000 years ago in San Diego County, I will absolutely come back and say I was wrong. Those look completely legitimate, even though I've been on tape for hours ranting against this site for the past year. You'll spray paint a dick on his car or something. (laughs) I mean, I'll get him back somehow. (laughs) All right, let's move right on to article number two. Stimulating the cerebellum relieves the social issues of autism. The cerebellum, that's the base part of the brain? Cerebellum is a little bit more accessible, yeah. And this is kind of, it controls your movements. It has a lot to do with coordination, that kind of stuff. It wasn't always associated with autism. And this research group did something really interesting, which is they did about five experiments in one. So one is they went... That's a time saver. It really is. So first they started with an autism mouse model where they had a genetic knockout that caused autism in mice. They noticed that they, mice and humans, both share a similar thing, which is in autistic people... The way the cerebellum kind of communicates to the rest of the brain can influence that autism. And that same pathway exists in both mice and humans. So first they showed an association that the cerebellum can cause these issues and and that this pathway is similar in both of these creatures. So wait, how did they find a way to vaccinize the mice? No, Ava, they didn't vaccinate (laughs) the mice. By the way, I like vaccinize. Uh, They didn't vaccinate the mice. Uh, They just did a genetic knockout because again, autism is a genetic disease. So So mice are also prone to MMR? Oh, God damn it. They first showed that this pathway exists in both of these creatures. Then they did something interesting where they took mice that did not have that autistic knockout that were socially normal And they inhibited the cerebellum in this one particular region, and all of a sudden, those supposedly normal mice started showing the social signs of autism. They would count how many food pellets were dropped into the the food bowl. That's exactly correct. They would they would do that, and then they would uh, not bang the other girl mice. That was (laughs) (laughs) that was too busy watching Wapner. Yeah. (laughs) So now they've gone. They've shown two things. They've shown this uh, pathway is the same in humans and mice. Then they've shown that in a healthy mouse, you can disrupt this pathway and cause those autistic symptoms. And then they decided to do something that was even more interesting, which is now we've disrupted the cerebellum in these mice. What if we, in the healthy mice, and caused the autistic symptoms, what if we do the opposite? What if we take that genetic knockout model where we have the autistic mice and we stimulate the cerebellum in that specific area that's not working correctly and see what happens? And when they did this, they got some amazing results, which is that those autistic mice suddenly started behaving socially as if they were normal. I mean, they still were pretty weird to talk to, but... They were like the, the mouse that would just start a conversation with you that you'd want it to end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they came up and they were already halfway in the middle of a conversation about how awesome they are at Jeopardy. <laughs> but what that seems to show or seems to indicate is that maybe there could be some alleviation of autistic symptoms in human beings if we were able to stimulate that part of the brain. And good news, we do stimulate that part of the brain with implants in human beings with schizophrenia. Like look at the tits on the back of that guy's head, man. There must be no autism. <laughs> Well, we do this in adults with schizophrenia, but we don't do this to children with schizophrenia. So one of the interesting new things we would have to do if we decided we wanted to try this for for certain autisms, and we want to go back and try this with kids, because obviously that would that would help their lifespan a lot. We've never done this particular surgery and this particular type of stuff with children, so it would be interesting to try that. But the good news is that they tried this when they, I remember I told you they did like five experiments in one. They didn't just do the stimulation on the mice when they were young. They also did it on the mice when they were older. And it worked. So even a mouse that grew up with those autistic symptoms, grew up with that brain suffering from autism, could then have that part of their brain stimulated and have some alleviation of those symptoms. I think we talked about it in the show, but wasn't there a radio lab or something where a man uh, essentially lost his autism? Right. And uh, it made him really sad and depressed. Because he realized that throughout his whole life, everybody was mocking him. Yeah. So there's some really sad mice just sobbing 
realizing nobody liked them. Nobody wanted to hear their stories. They started playing with the other mice, so we saw that they were being social. Then they started crying out of control, and then they realized they were no longer good at math. That was the that was the step uh, that it went through. Did we reverse flowers for Algernon? We, these mice? <laughs> we did. It was uh, it was flowers for Algernon, but in a social setting. So like all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden that mouse was like he he was all nerdy and he was all on his own, and now he's like wearing a mouse Letterman jacket, and he's <laughs> picking on some other mouse with autism. <laughs> <laughs> flowers for steve <laughs> but it's interesting because i it brings up this idea that we don't know is this going to work directly in humans this is going to completely alleviate symptoms and this would require consistent shocking to the brain or consistent neuromodulation is what we call it it wouldn't just be one of those one-time things so it would be something that would be part of probably somebody's lifelong routine that brings up some issues. Oh, is that really worth it? And is this really going to have the same effect in humans? Obviously, our ability to categorize mice social interaction is much different than our ability to do so with humans. Isn't there a lot of benefit, though, to, to electroshock? I mean, less depression. Be. Yes, there can be a certain time. This is nothing like, though. That's massive electroshock. That's completely different from this. This is a, a very targeted neuromodulation, tiny stimulation of certain parts of the brain. This would not occur through through the type of electroshock therapy that they use for people who are depressed like so one is would it work on humans we don't know would it have the same would it have overarching effects is it going to completely wipe away the social issues probably not will it improve them probably will if it does though is that something that we want to do like is getting rid of autism always good like let's be honest would we have microsoft if we didn't have autism no would we you know would we have a lot of the coding developments and quite frankly scientific developments if we didn't have autism no we wouldn't well i mean autism is a spectrum so yes yeah. there is the the bill gates yes but again there also is the 300 pound baby huey who like throws their parents through windows right but this is talking about like mice's social interaction and stuff i think this would probably be most ac applicable to kind of the bill gates aspergery type things and like I mean, listen, I feel sad that Bill Gates didn't have a lot of friends and spent his, his days coding when he was 12 or 13. But in a way, we all benefit. Like, the world in general benefited from that. Are we removing them from the system that, quite frankly, they participate in currently? So if you wanted to be a supervillain and right. make the world a worse place in a legitimate way, one way you could do it is to go back in time and uh -huh. befriend a young Bill Gates. Right. And just, it, yeah, give him the Letterman jacket, then you guys can start p picking on some autistic mice. <laughs> introduce him to girls. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the idea of a 13-year-old Bill Gates wearing a, like a football jersey and tossing mice by their tails into walls. Out of my way, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move right on to everybody's favorite game. I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. I call BS is the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Damien, are you ready to play? Yes, I am. Dr. Ava, are you ready to play? Yes, but I am a little ill right now, so I feel as if I am a disadvantage, and Damien might get another win further extending his win streak. I doubt because that. Because he's so smart. I doubt that, and I don't think you're on a win streak. All right, let's start with article number one. A new study indicates that tailgating, while a total jerk move, actually helps traffic move more quickly because more cars can fit on the road at any given time. Damien's a science or bad science. This is science, but what's left out of the article is how just how impressive it is that somebody can tailgate so well uh, on the freeway while driving, you know, flipping a burger, cracking a beer. It's amazing to watch those guys. I mean, you know, Michigan State, I think, one of the best tailgating <laughs> groups. All right, they and, drive and drink as a team. And Dr. Ava. I am going to say that this is bad science, but it should be said that as a female driver, I am I, I feel very overwhelmed on the road, and it's not sexist if I say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, Dr. Ava, not at all. <laughs> Article number two, new research shows that while presenting scientific facts about climate change to educated conservatives actually causes a backfire effect which strengthens their skepticism, presenting them with the overwhelming scientific consensus dramatically decreases their skepticism. Damien, is this science or bad science? I don't want to get political, but this is science because all educated conservatives have left the party. Like, like, like if you're still conservative in the party of Trump... I would question your intelligence. Well, yeah, listen, I'm, I, lo I love low taxes. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. If you're conservative, doesn't mean you're a Republican. In fact, you could be a very true conservative and be very angry that you're a conservative and that this guy Trump is here as part of your party. And he's not necessarily. So if Dwight D. Eisenhower was yeah. alive right now, exactly. would he? how would he be swayed by climate change? I'm still going to say science. All right. And Dr. Ava. 
I too will say it is science, because uh, Damien is such an educated and smart man on such an incredible win streak that uh, I would be foolish not to follow him. Okay, see, all of a sudden I've become suspicious that this is the real Dr. Ava, because Damien's never been on a win streak. That seems like a weird claim for her to make. <laughs> well, and I mean, fortunately, you can see me in the studio, so... And I know you're too strong to break the fourth wall for the fans. <laughs> Article number three. A group of archaeologists are suing President Trump over the effects of shrinking the Bears Ear monuments. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. It is a far more respectable profession, paleontology, that is suing. Oh, how dare you. It is true. They say those who cannot paleo arc. Wait, so are you saying it's science, Dr. Amos? That was... Uh... I... Oh, no, you were just agreeing with Damien. Yes, yes. Then I will say science to uh, disagree with him. All right. And lastly, article number four. A new study reveals that hypnosis can actually fundamentally alter brain states causing synesthesia. Damien, is this science or bad science? And for those of you guys who might not know what synesthesia is, that is where that is an experience that is usually considered innate, that is part of a human being's brain as is, though it can be induced by chemicals like LSD, in which you can do things like hear what a color sounds like, or you can see sound. It's basically a mixture, a cross-wiring of your senses that allows you to experience one particular input as a different sense. Like if I could see the heat emanating off of a crotch or... No, I mean, like a predator could do that, right? Like that'd be... <laughs> yes, a predator could. It'd be more like if you could see the sound emanating out of the person crying while you're looking at their crotch. That's hotter. Uh, I'm going to say science. And Dr. Ava. I would say that this is bad science. I have not been hypnotized, and yet all five of my senses can sense the sexiness coming off of Damien. Oh, that is certainly not something Dr. Ava would say. Nor people would say. Well, I mean, more people with, with synesthesia who can sense sexiness in such a way. Se I don't think sexiness is like a, a sense. I don't think you, you can see it or hear it or... No, it's, it's a taste. It's a, oh, you, know, okay. <laughs> you have receptors on your tongue. It's like brisket. All right. Uh, let's go back and see how you guys did, following home and see how you did. Article number one, a new study indicates that tailgating, while a total jerk move, actually helps traffic move more quickly because more cars can fit on the road at a given time. Damien thinks this is true. Dr. Ava thinks this is false. And this one is bad science. It is the opposite. The researcher, ironically named Horn, which I love, no better traffic researcher name, found that it slows down dramatically based on tailgating, and we've all probably experienced this. There's something called phantom traffic jams, which basically happen where you guys, I don't know, especially happens in Southern California a lot, you'll be driving around and you'll all of a sudden hit this little packet of traffic, and you won't know why. There's no accident, there's not a bunch of people merging, there's nothing, and it'll just move on. What happens is this accordion-like effect where people tailgate. Well, what happens when you're tailgating? That means that if somebody has to minorly adjust their speed ahead of you, you have to basically slam on your brakes. Well, that leads the guy behind you to slam on your brakes, the guy behind them, the guy behind them, and it essentially creates a traffic jam as if something is blocking the road when there's nothing in the fucking road and it's incredibly frustrating. We could blame the tailgater or the guy at the front could just fucking go faster. That's true. <laughs> what they found is if you just keep the right spacing between cars, if you were to set like a, a specific distance between all cars and just keep that spacing, you, those cars would move along consistently because as long as you let some wiggle room where if one guy had to slow down, there was enough room where that, the next guy behind him could slow down without slamming on the brake so it didn't create that accordion like effect you would create a much more traffic free environment you could cut the traffic in half and in fact the best way to do this would be to basically automate it you're not driving the car you get in your tesla or your whatever it senses the car in front of you car behind you it puts you like in a wagon train and just sends you down the road so the car would have synesthesia and would able to that's sense that's not what synesthesia <laughs> means dr ava and that would be really helpful because that would even a small number of cars on the road doing this would greatly decrease traffic and one of the notes of this study and, and other traffic studies to, to remember is it only takes a few bad drivers to cause a lot of traffic. And I'm not talking about a driver getting into an accident. It only takes a few bad drivers tailgating, making that accordion thing to cause a lot of traffic for a lot of people. It's one of those things where, you know, the one or two percent of people ca can cause like 60 percent of traffic. I feel like there is an Asian joke in here somewhere. That is, that's probably a good, that's probably a good feeling, Ava. But I would not say that because I am not a racist person like Damien or Poppy. Not at all. <laughs> Uh, article number two, new research shows that while presenting scientific facts about climate change to educated conservatives actually causes a backfire effect which strengthens their skepticism, presenting them with the overwhelming scientific consensus dramatically decreases their skepticism. Both of you guessed out this one was science, and this one is science, and it's incredibly interesting. Though, in keeping with what we learned about the chemistry thing, it requires some follow-up studies. So researchers have found that attitudes 
towards scientific belief on climate change among self-declared conservatives were on average 35 percentage points lower than the actual scientific consensus. Among liberals, is about 20 percentage points lower. What's really interesting about this, and this is a well-known documented fact, super educated conservatives actually believe in climate change a little less than non-educated ones. The reason is they're using their logic ability, their education, their whatever, to reinforce the beliefs which are more of social beliefs, which is that climate change isn't real, and they use their intelligence to kind of back that up so that, ironically, they're more educated but less knowledgeable about this specific thing and have stronger beliefs that it's not true. I'm picturing a conversation with Rex Tillerson, like... <laughs> Are you saying that oil is bad? But what they found was if you just present these people with the facts, hey, here's the climate data, here are the temperature readings, here is this, this, and this, there's something called the backfire effect where they're going to stick even more strongly to their beliefs, and especially the educated ones. However, if you ignore the outright facts of it and start talking about the scientific consensus that 97% of climate scientists all believe in this, all of a sudden their numbers dramatically shift. This is really interesting. Now, this only applies to the educated conservatives, but you go from having less belief than your standard conservative that anthropomorphic climate change is true to not only more, but you have such a jump, you actually beat out liberal, pre-treatment liberals. They, they come almost as close to post-treatment liberals, i.e. liberals who you've told this is the scientific consensus to. The idea is these people are educated. They see scientists hopefully, as educated people who know what they're doing and, you know, who are actually looking into what's going on. And they don't want to be on the wrong side of the issue. They don't want to be the wrong ones. Nobody wants to be wrong. So instead of showing them the facts and somebody else could be showing them alternative facts, if you can prove to them that there's a consensus, now they feel like they're going to be on the wrong side. They're on the dumb side if they don't move over and their points jump up like 20 percentage points. Couldn't you argue against how educated and intelligent some of these men are that they feel so strongly despite not doing any research on what the actual issue is? And who knows? Maybe they they just have bad research skills. That happens a lot, too. You have people who don't know how to find the real answer. You have people that are bombarded with fake information. Now, all of a sudden, you have this real stuff in front of you. It, the idea is that we need to change the discussion. I think this is really important because this should change the discussion we have about climate change. We shouldn't be going to people and saying, look, here we go. Here are the Here's the climate data from 2010 through 2017. Here's this, this, and this. Look Look at these sea level rises, look at this. There's always going to be an out. But if you start over and over again, hammering in the consensus angle, here is the consensus. Now we're, we're having them put themselves kind of on the fringe. Now they're the 3% that are off in the middle of nowhere. That seems to be way more effective. Now, again, follow-up studies are needed, but I would say this to anybody who's trying to change an educated conservative's mind about climate change. If you are trying to do it with facts, you're almost as dumb as they are. Because we know that that does not work. We know that the backfire effect that takes hold, we know that those people bite down, they, they, they dig in, they go even further to their side. But if instead you do what's smart, ignore those, ignore your emotion, try not to insult them, go for the consensus angle, you have a huge chance of improving that. And one of these things they talk about is that this is a door opening. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to switch their views automatically. What it means is it's going to open the door for them to change their mind in the future. Also, was something interesting, and this is from other studies, we have found that over and over again, if you want to change somebody's mind about climate change, stop addressing it with carbon issues. Stop addressing it as climate change. Stop addressing it with, as CO2. Start talking about pollution. Start calling it Obama's climate change. <laughs> right? No, you talk about pollution. You talk about littering. You talk about these things, which have a much more universal appeal in terms of people wanting to stop them. You know, there was a time when conservatives dominated a lot of groups like Sierra Club and other things like that. They wanted to clean up national parks. You know, they didn't like seeing litter and trash lying around. Yeah, but but now, now they're the type who wants to drill into national parks. Well, it depends. You know, I would still, I bet you those conservative people that we think are so anti-environment, I bet you in their own way, they're very pro-environment. I bet you if they went to a campsite, they would pick up all the trash that it's on the ground. You know, it's it's a different thing. And so we have to start saying we can't tailor our message to the way we want the message to sound. We have to tailor our message to how it's most effective. And it's most effective when we tell them what they need to hear in the language that, that works the best. I think my problem with this method is that there's no justice. This person never gets to feel how dumb they were. They, they, they get away scot-free for saying dumb things for so long. Yes, but it's a small price to pay. <laughs> No, I need my vengeance. I need to be able, I need like Batman. Batman doesn't do the criminal justice system. He punches people. I want, I believe in a Batman. Your climate change Batman? Climate change Batman.
<laughs> All right. Article number three. A group of archaeologists are suing President Trump over the effects of shrinking the Bears Ears monument. Damien thinks this is false. Ava thinks this is true. And this one is bad science. It's actually a group of paleontologists. <laughs> oh, play the man, not the game. <laughs> <laughs> but as the rule which I instituted right before I read that answer says, if you get the answer exactly right, you get a minus point. So, Damien, you actually lose a point what? on that this, one. This has never, this has is, never been the case. You're inventing point. rules. You've lost a point for getting it exactly right. So it's actually paleontologists. The Society of Vertimate Paleontology, an international nonprofit coalition of like-minded researchers, recently announced that they will be taking legal action to block Trump's cuts because by reducing this monument, they're actually exposing a bunch of very important paleontological resources to looters and to other people. And there are some federal laws in place for the protection of those resources. And so what they're saying is essentially by doing this, you are impacting the protections for these resources and they're suing him for it. Good for him because there's a bunch of cultural resources or archaeological resources there as well. And so uh, I want the, those all those to be protected and hopefully they are successful and the other attempts are successful because those national monuments really are important for preserving open spaces and anyone who lives anywhere around them can see the encroachments on them are coming from all sides. So the more land we can set aside now, the better, and we won't be able to set it aside in the future because you can't make an, uh, you can't just make a national monument where somebody's a bunch of people's houses are. So we can do it now. We won't be able to do it after they grade in there and build stuff. Like, so like... Ben Franklin's house isn't a national monument or anything. They didn't just kick the, they kicked a poor Irish family out. That, that's right. <laughs> Article number four, a new study reveals that hypnosis can actually fundamentally alter brain states causing synesthesia. Damien thinks this is true. Ava thinks this is false. And this one is science, meaning Damien would be the winner had he not gotten that minus point no, on question no. number three. I, which I, I, Congratulations, Ava, who's able to win this game without even being here, Damien. It's like you're not trying. It's like you are not even trying mm, to win this I game. Won. Every I, I, time. Every time you lose. I am honored, but I do not agree with the 205. Yeah, stop being so, I, stop I, being so humble, I Ava. I would like to abdicate my victory. Stop being humble, Ava. This is what encourages Damien is when you do this. All right. <laughs> Indeed, uh, this is a really interesting study because synesthesia is usually something somebody is born with. There are people whose brains just do this naturally. A lot of times, by the way, this helps them with certain things like mathematical ability. If the number four is associated in your mind, if you think of the number four and you see the color blue, for whatever reason, that seems to help people do certain kinds of complex math or visualizing math in their head because that number four now has a second reference point. So they not just see the number four, they actually have that feeling or that sight of the of the color blue, which can help them then memorize a lot of numbers at the same time, work with them in their head. And synesthesia tends to occur in people who have a lot of mathematical aptitude, a lot of math geniuses have this. It also happens, uh, a lot of people will know this, under exposure to certain hallucinogens. That can also cause you, people will see it, talk about seeing the music. People will talk about these mixtures of, of sensory inputs that seem to kind of get messed up when you take certain types of hallucinogens. This is very similar to how Damien arouses all of the senses. Uh, I don't think that's true. You know what? I think she's, she's, she's too busy winning and I called BS. I think too. she's trying to show pity to Damien because she's so sad that he has lost yet another one of these in a row. I don't like that you're mansplaining victory to Dr. <laughs> Ava, Bobby. <laughs> So they basically tried hypnotism, which a lot of people kind of poo-poo away because they think, well, it's not, it's kind of BS, it's not real. And, it's, and some of it is, uh, you know, no one's going to come in and hypnotize you into being the Manchurian candidate. But there are some people who are highly susceptible to hypnotic suggestion, and they can be helped. We know that a lot of people will use it to quit smoking, will use it to help with a diet or better their life. This is a similar idea, only this is a real dramatic change because you could always argue, well, whoever's going to agree to go get hypnotized to stop smoking. They really want to stop smoking. They have ulterior, blah, 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 blah. This is looking at a very finite thing. Do you experience the synesthesia? It takes people who don't experience it on their own. It puts them through a hypnotic track that basically induces synesthesia. And then it tests, do they experience synesthesia? And it's either, it's pretty binary. Yes or no, I do or I don't. And they showed that you can. That's amazing. You're affecting a pretty significant change in human brain and human perception in somebody. If all of a sudden they're seeing music or hearing colors, you're you're making something really substantial happen in their brain for something that we kind of thought was a parlor trick not that long ago. I have a question about hypnosis. You know those hypno hypnotists who put on a show yeah. and like and like make people do crazy things. Right. Isn't that's bullshit, right? No, there are people who are highly susceptible. Now, here's no with a caveat. The caveat is if any of those people were either a not highly susceptible or didn't really want to do what they were doing. Like you could, he couldn't hypnotize them and be like murder everybody. Like that wouldn't work. 
but it's all in good fun. Everybody's in that environment. It's like they're playing along, but the hypnotist is causing them to play along. So it is real. Like in the same way a faith healer can make somebody actually go unconscious. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's a good way. It's, it's a little bit of, of that kind of placebo effect. You're dumb enough, the effect will work on you. It's not even dumb. It's, it works on smart people. It's really more of susceptibility. It's, it's a different category we're looking at. And those type of things, like, okay, I can be hypnotized or I can't. Keep in mind, that hypnotist is not pulling up a random person from the audience. They are taking the most susceptible person to do that thing, too. So it would be like if you said, like, hey, I have this really heavy weight. I have a, let's say, a 100-pound weight. I'm going to pull someone randomly up from the audience. Can they lift it? Well, if you pick someone randomly, there's a decent chance they can't lift it. Let's go even higher. Let's say 200-pound weight. If you pick a random person out of the audience, there's not a very big chance that they're going to be able to lift it. But if that hypnotist, by doing his hypnotist thing, can pick out the one who's most susceptible, i.e. pick the giant biker guy, he can probably do it. There's probably one or two people in that audience that are susceptible enough to be in that stage show. He finds those people. It's not anybody that can be up there. Well, I wonder what the tells are. What the, what the tells uh, walking through it's, the door. It's when they're going along with him. Because he does his hypnotic act on stage, and he can tell who's going along based on their body movements. Really expert hypnotists are watching your movements. They're, they know who the susceptible people are based on the kind of the pre-show and the warm-up and everything. I'd like to see the amazing Randy tackle that, as I also like to see him tackle the farce of a competition that is I Call BS. And I would like to see him tackle that big biker we just talked about. <laughs> that would be hilarious. That guy's in his 80s. <laughs> He's not a big guy either. <laughs> I'm here to disprove the myth that that guy's a big-ass biker. <laughs> He's on the Million Dollar Challenge. I'm going to tackle the shit out of that guy. <laughs> that is a show I'd watch. <laughs> Uh, of the four the highly hypnotizable participants in the study, three showed a strong synesthesia-like association between symbol and color, as shown by their verbal reports and confirmation by eye tracking. However, the nature of the association varied widely. Two of the participants reported that they visually experienced the symbols as having the suggested color, in one case with full self-awareness of doing so, in another case not, so sometimes they're not even realizing that. It's interesting the t control group didn't show any of those, so we know that it's not just an issue of the way the test was carried out. And again, this needs to be replicated. That's We're going to have to keep hammering that in, especially after today. But very, very interesting stuff. And it might lead to an interest. I would like to experience that. I would like to go see if I can't get hypnotized and experience synesthesia. That'd be kind of neat. Wouldn't it be crazy if you and I went to a show and they, and they made us kiss because we were hypnotized, Bobby? Yeah, that'd be, be crazy, right? I would prefer it if you stop suggesting that every time we go to a hypnotist show, though. <laughs> this guy isn't even a hypnotist. He's a stand-up comic. Right. Why? Yeah, and also, uh, again, James Randi has asked you to stop sending him emails <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, congratulations, David, on your victory. Perhaps we should move on to the next segment. What a humble, <laughs> humble winner that Ava is. That's just, that's just amazing. All right, guys, let's move right on to Damien Channels, a dead scientist. And now... Damien Channels the Dead Scientist. Don't go fuck yourself. All right, this is Damien Channels the Dead Scientist, where Damien pretends that he's somehow channeling the spirit, which of course doesn't exist, of some kind of dead scientist, and then myself and the scientist, who might not participate today, mm -hmm. then pick apart his uh, obvious ruse. Damien, are you ready to go? Yes, I am ready to go, but uh, I feel that I, it'd be unfair of me to let the fans just, I think they should hear both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And they should also know that the amazing Randy has found that I do communicate with spirits. You okay. can YouTube that video somewhere. Okay. But uh, basically, I'm going to reach deep into the ether. I'm going to uh, pluck the soul, one of many, of a famous scientist, bring them here to Earth so that our fans can get smarter. Pick the brain of a great mind. Okay. All right, so uh, I've lit all the candles, I've dimmed the lights. Mm -hmm. Let's get this started. <sighs> I like how he says spirits every time summoning. It makes it very believable. Who <laughs> uh. oh, uh, 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 is summoning Thomas Henry Huxley here into this well-endowed body? Uh, no one summoned you, Damien, pretending to be Huxley. But Huxley, obviously, uh, got, a, got a very interesting past in association with physical anthropology and, and Darwin himself. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about Huxley's life? I'd be more than happy to. I don't get to come down to Earth too often, I do. Uh, I, Thomas Henry Huxley, a.k.a. Darwin's Bulldog, a.k.a. The Hux, and a.k.a. Dr. Huxtable. No, none, which, of those, none of those were true. <laughs> Dr. Huxtable is not aged as well. No, 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 no. Especially when your statement was, I'm going to put that old science of creationism to sleep. <laughs> I slipped in a disco biscuit, I did. <laughs> I am a biologist with a specialization in comparative anatomy, which back in my day just meant helping gents decide whose totter was tops. <laughs> 
I am a passionate zoologist who wrote A Man's Place in Nature, 1963, which was a book that can be thought of as a kind of Zagat's Guide, but for animals' fannies. Oh, God. See, I thought you were going to go the other way. I thought you were going to say that he was the radical feminist of his generation, and he thought the man's place in nature was to stay at home with the kids. I don't disagree with that. Okay, fair enough. It could also be said that my book had a hidden subtext that gives evidence for the evolution of man and apes from a common ancestor. Mm -hmm. But that's only if you believe in that insane interpretation. Oh, really? And not the fanny. The more obvious fanny interpretation. And if you do believe that, then you could also say that that was the first book devoted to the topic of human evolution. That would be a fun fact. As one of the most... You, you and me mean human evolution specifically because Darwin at the time had read... Re, re, specifically did not mention yeah, human evolution Yeah, he had put origin, origin of the species, species, but he had not yet written The Descent of Man. He had not. He had not uh, still in my idea. Uh, and as one of the best-groomed and knowledgeable scientists of the Victorian era, I am perhaps best known for vigorously promoting and arguing for one of the most revolutionary ideas in the history of science, and that is Huxley's theory of evolution. That, that's not... That wasn't your theory. That was... Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. That was not... I mean, you defended it, but that was not yours theory. Tell me, mate. Who gets the Grammy? Taylor Swift or what? Or songwriter? I mean, from what I understand, I believe it was supposed to be Kanye at that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true that Dar- you darwin kanye me. That's, oh, is, that, is that what happened? Uh, is it true that Darwin did come up with the bloody theory? Yes. But who took his message to the public? Who is making sure that opponents of natural selection were getting properly huxed? Is that a is that a verb that you use now? Well, it was we, we, when I used to serve people like the Archbishop of Oxford. I, I, it was a common saying that they'd say you just got hoxed. Yeah, okay, interesting. It was a it was a pre Christopher Hitchens hitch slap. I liked it's more concise. And, uh, Charlie wasn't uh, defending evolution. He was at home wanking it while I did all the hard work. But I digress. One of my most famous moments was when I bollocks the Archbishop Samuel Wilberforce. A.K.A. Soapy Sam. And that is a real nickname that he had. because Soapy he was, Sam? Because you was so slippery in debate. Oh, okay. I thought it was because he and Tyler Durden had opened up their company in the middle of Fight Club. I thought you were going to go with an incarceration re- reference okay. about dropping uh, <laughs> soaps and whatnot. I'm very proud that you went with a proper Fight Club. That's right. Uh, there was one moment in the debate that was particularly memorable, and that is when old Soapy Sam, while ridiculing evolution, asked me whether I was descended from an ape on my grandmother's side or on my grandfather. To which I replied something to the effect of, I would rather be the offspring of two apes than be a man afraid to face the truth. That was a paraphrase, of course. Uh, and after which the crowd of educated Victorian gentlemen broke out in a unanimous, Oh! Oh, and punctuated by the occasional, no, he didn't. To be fair, though, the context is lost in that uh, historically because the truth was actually the name that Huxley had for his finishing move. He, he jumped from the top ropes. <laughs> yes, and, and why he was stunned from, yeah. the, from this he does He does a headbutt from the top ropes. He calls it the truth. <laughs> True, you, you, you've heard the stories, yes. I, and then while he was stoned from the truth, I body slammed him a few times and threw him into a Boston crab and the debate was over. In true Victorian style. Some may also be interested to know that I coined the term agnostic to distinguish people who believed what I believe from atheists. Uh, to me, uh, an atheist denies the existence of God. To me, agnosticism was an acceptance of the idea that human mind could only could not go beyond certain limits. But I will say that since being Kanye'd by Darwin, I will say that no god would allow this to happen, and I am firmly in the atheist camp. Uh, I would say that we kind of, maybe we just define that differently now, as we think of those as a a statement towards belief or a statement towards knowledge. So people who are theists believe in a god. People who are atheists don't believe that that burden of proof has been met, so they don't believe in a god. That, That would be a different thing from saying that they actually believe there is no god. They believe they have positive evidence for a no god. But regardless, keep keep going, Mr. Mr. Huxley. Uh, well, I, 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 would you like for me to go on about my tales on the HMS Rattlesnake, or would you prefer questions of a different variety? Uh, sure, let's go Let's go with questions. So, you were obviously Darwin's bulldog. He was my beagle, if anything. I oh, was, okay. He was a very cheapest man. I was uh, mutton chops that screamed out for mail. So, so, let me ask you, did you guys actually know, like, had anybody, any hominid fossils actually been discovered at the time that you were so vehemently defending Darwin? Well, it was such an exciting time, and so many things had, had happened. I suppose maybe in some corner, uh, hominid fossils had been discovered, but no, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, 
Okay, and and just one more question. They actually had they had discovered both the uh, Neanderthals and some Homo erectus, which at that time was called Pithecanthropus <laughs> erectus. But I do have I do have one question. I think this will definitely tell if you're Thomas Huxley or not. You were referred to as Darwin's bulldog. Yes, and and, and Doctor Huxley. And, and <laughs> I don't think that was the last one. And bulldogs famously have a pushed in face. What is the name for the pushed in face on bulldogs? What is the medical term for a dog that has that type of pushed in face? <laughs> Obviously, Thomas Henry Huxley, as a bulldog himself, would know this. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was more a fan of pushing in the other end. Okay, yeah. Of, of ah, boom! <laughs> boom, Damien! I have proved that you are not Thomas Henry Huxley. It does short face. It does. <laughs> uh, it's actually called brachiocephaly or brachiocephalic, those dogs. So, congratulations. Maybe now you I, can try and fool I, some other sucker. I don't believe that was a term invented when I uh, was I in power. Was, totally uh, ask me about a bear's vagina. I can tell you <laughs> I can speak for days. We will talk after the show. All right. Uh, get out of here. Get out of here, Damien, with your fake stuff. Fine. Char- upstaged by Darwin again. Oh, cheerio. Good one. <sighs> Were you convinced? Not in the slightest. And I think I had a very scientific reason not to be. It was very fun to see the spirit of uh, Thomas Henry Huxley into the room. I urge all of our fans to uh, be skeptical, but acknowledge that Bobby is also wrong. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming back for Science Faction 205, where you learned about Homo heidelbergensis, how one-fifth of all material chemistry papers appear to be complete BS, how stimulating the cerebellum may relieve autistic symptoms in humans, why tailgating ruins traffic, how to convince an educated conservative that climate change is real, why paleontologists are suing Trump, and how hypnosis can cause synesthesia. Thank you so much for listening, and please come on back next week for Science Faction 206. People think that I was called Darwin's bulldog because I argued his ideas so viciously. But in reality, it was because of the way that he fed me peanut butter. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs>